In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 it says I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. The crucified life like I shared in the first part of the message I'm just recapping a little bit for you here. We all know from the beginning that it pertains to living a life where you put to death all the lusts of the flesh, the fleshy life, the unsanctified life or what the Bible calls the unregenerated life, your old life, the life that is ungodly, to put it in very simple human language, ungodly life. That is not of God. That is the crucified life. But if we look at another aspect of the crucified life, when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, his sight was pierced. That piercing of his sight, if you read Ephesians chapter 5, it says there, as the rib was taken out of Adam to make a woman, Likewise, when the sight of the Lord Jesus was pierced, a rib, so to speak, was taken out from his sight to make his bride, the church. And Paul writes there, that's why we are bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. The very words that Adam used when he spoke of Eve, his sight was pierced. Figuratively speaking, to take the rib to make his bride. So we are now part. You are now in him. And when you live the life in Christ Jesus, the life of Christ is not an ordinary life. It is a supernatural life in the spirit realm. In the beginning, before sin ever came to this world, there was no such thing as a natural realm and the spiritual realm. There was only one realm, the real realm. No divider. Adam walked in the garden and he saw God face to face. They handled God, they talked with God, they fellowshiped with God. They had a jolly good time, not only with God, but also all the people or the beings in the house of God. He had communion with them. He had fellowship with them. He could see them. There was no divider between Adam and heavenly realm. Because there was only one. Purity. Holiness. But as soon as he sinned. There became a great dichotomy. In the universe. The equation all changed. In the beginning. Before sin came, there was only one law that ruled the entire universe. One law of physics, the God's law. You know, today if you study physics and science, the electrons carry a positive and a negative charge. But in the beginning, it was not so. There was only one charge, positive. The law of the spirit which is life, not death, life. But when sin came, God spoke the words, now death shall reign. When death came, it altered the entire structure. Human DNA change, soil samples, the law, of life in the soil, in nature, changed. Everything changed because of sin. Now, when you get born again in Christ Jesus, and you live a life, not an ordinary life. You know, if you go on living an ordinary Christian life, it will bore you to death. Do you think it is meaningful to get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, 
rush to work, work like a mad dog, and then you get stuck in the traffic for hours, wasting all your precious time, and then you come back home to an empty house because people like to live all alone, you know. You come to an empty house and on your best friend is a cat or a dog. <laughs> and what do you become? Like them. <laughs> and then you watch TV, have TV dinner, go to bed. Am I right? A dog's life, a cat's life. And then, come Sunday, you come to church, pious Christian, sit in the church, stand up when the hymns are sung, and sit down, and then stand up again, put some offering, hear a homily, and then get the benediction, and you go back home. Meaningless, boring, silly life. But this is not the life that God has for us. The Christ life is an exciting life. It's a wonderful life. It's a glorious life. It's a challenging life. Every day, there's always something new. That is, by the way, the slogan of our network. There is always something new. Let me give you one example, you know. You know, one man of God in the U.S. had a blessed privilege of being caught up to heaven. And he saw above the throne of God, the seraphim, flying around. And they were crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You read that in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. So he saw them flying around and around and around, just saying nothing but holy, holy, holy. And the angel who was accompanying him, he asked that angel, he said, all they are doing, for how long? So the angel said, I don't know. Ever since I was created, I've been seeing them flying around and around and around. And how long have you been created? Oh, I lost count. We don't count because there's no time in heaven for eons of time. So he was wondering, all they do is just go around and around and around. See, even when you go up to heaven, you're thinking earthly. So he asked the angel, won't it be boring? And the angel gave a beautiful answer. He said, each time they go around, they see God, one aspect of his manifestation they get so excited they're crying holy 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 they make another round they come they see another aspect and they get so excited and they're worshiping holy 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 which means for eons of time they're seeing different 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 manifestation of god's glory no end no beginning, no end. This is the exciting Christ life, you know. You're not walking with mortal man. You're walking in heaven. When you come to church, you're not entering into a building. You're coming before Mount Zion in the company of innumerable angels. The scriptures will become alive. On the outside, it may look like a building, you know. But as soon as you step in, you are stepping into another realm. This is the Christ life. This is the crucified life. You are crucified from this realm to the next realm. And into such a life of intimacy, of knowing him. God is calling his people, come, come. It's not for a select few, those mistakes in the jungles or caves, no. It's for everybody. 
do does brother never look like someone saying living in a cave now oh, look at him he's so smartly dressed right i may look like someone who's from the cave <laughs> ordinary common people you know if you read the life of enoch he was a married family man when he started walking with god some people like to say oh it's only possible for you who don't have a family who don't have a regular job you know i started walking with god when i was a high school teacher i would get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and wait on god up to 6 o'clock in the morning and then i go to my school i teach i come back in the evening and i go out to do ministry by the time i come back home and hit the pillow it's 12 midnight 11 or 12 midnight and i get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to wait pray you know the body can be trained to obey the laws of the spirit science says you need 7 hours to sleep every day that is the natural laws of death why are you leaving the laws of death silly isn't it you are you are spending so much of money on botox <laughs> anti wrinkle cream anti aging cream all the money you are spending only to die <laughs> does it make sense you are doing all that and leaving a, the law of death yeah. why when you can live by the law of the spirit unto life this is the crucified life or rather the resurrected christ life to such a life god is calling his church to walk in that is a triumphant life you walk in triumphantness you overcome every physical law which is absolutely possible age stops decay stops everything stops instead of spending your money on cosmetics give it to me you know <laughs> i show you a better way a better way a shortcut the life of in christ is a supernatural life in the spirit realm now if you read matthew chapter 24 verse 14 the lord jesus said and this gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in all the world then the end come the gospel of the kingdom now i would like you to understand this phrase the lord jesus it was said this gospel he said the gospel of the kingdom why at the word kingdom in matthew 26 a woman comes and anoints him for his burial and he tells the disciples wherever this gospel is preached remember this woman now in that sense he just said gospel but here he says the gospel of this kingdom in the end times the gospel that must be preached is not an ordinary gospel unto salvation but the proclamation of the coming of god's kingdom Amen. that's the good news the kingdom of god is coming and when the kingdom of god comes what is the life in the kingdom of god that's why we are sharing that's why god is moving us to prepare the bride of christ for the kingdom of god what is the lifestyle 
in the kingdom of God. What are the powers of the age to come that are available in the kingdom of God? If you want to live in God's kingdom, a kingdom has a king. And the king rules. Not democracy, you know. It's theocratic kingdom. Democracy was never the will of God. That is man's will. To elect a king, it's man's will. Anyway, a kingdom has a king, and a kingdom has princes, and a kingdom has people. So God's kingdom, the kingdom of God ruling in your hearts before you can step into that kingdom. That is why when God looks at us, he tells us in Exodus chapter 19 verse 6 and 1 Peter 2 verse 9, we are appointed a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood. See, why use all those words, therefore? A royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests, because the kingdom of God is coming. Several years ago, it has always been my custom, when I go to preach in a crusade, the first day of the, it's all, usually three days, you know, the first day, I always share my testimony, because all the non-Christians need to hear how being a Hindu priest, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my savior. And the last day, I preached on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This has been my custom for more than 20 years. But in the year 2006, I was preaching in a crusade in South India. The second day, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared before me and he said, from now onwards, you shall preach only about my second coming everywhere where you go. The gospel of the kingdom. The time has now come. You shall only preach this. Don't preach anything else. I have other people to do that. You specifically and our entire network. 60% of the programs are about the gospel of God's kingdom, kingdom living, the supernatural living, the mysteries of God, hidden riches and mysteries that have been hidden for a long time, now been made manifest. That is the life that God is calling us to live. This gospel of the kingdom, we must understand what that is to live by the kingdom. This is the true throne room or kingdom living. Now you may have heard of people saying, oh, I went to the throne room. It's not that easy, you know. You, you heard our dear brother Neville sharing about different places in paradise where only babes in Christ are. You know, heaven is not like a city in Los Angeles, you just walk anywhere you like. Do you think an ordinary citizen, let me ask you this question like this, can any ordinary citizen walk into the Oval Office and say, hey, President Obama, I just came to say hi to you. Is it possible? No. If it is not possible for an earthly president, you think you can just simply come into the throne and say, Hi, God. <coughs> you think it's possible? No. What mostly people claim, I had a throne room experience, is not actually the throne room, you know. I'll tell you one mystery. The physical throne of God exists in a place in heaven. But those who are of lesser spiritual stature, whichever part of heaven they are, they will see the throne of Christ 
like near them, but that is not the actual throne. It is like a holographic image, but still it will look real. It's not hologram, you know. It's not like you can put your hand through. You will still see the throne, it look real, but it is not that manifested throne of God. Who can stand there? He who has clean hands. He who has clean lips. Who is he who is without guile? He who has a clean heart. They stand there. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, you know. Many people who have experiences of heaven, they go to the fringes of heaven. Paradise, you know. Fringes, only fringes. And it tastes of some good things to come. Of course you will see the throne, throne of Christ. But that is not the real physical throne where the throne actually is. And the place where the Father God abides or abodes is entirely different. Recently I read a book, you know, someone sent me for my uh, opinion. From cover to cover, this person wrote, Oh, if you read that book, it will make all our experience like child's play. Now, I'm not putting down that brother, you know, but one reading, the, the language that is used to describe, shows he has never ever been even to the fringes of heaven. The throne or the place where God the Father abides is not like a drive through McDonald, you know. That each time you like, you just drive through, hi God, and you walk away. Ah, it's not like that, you know. It's not like that. Even the holiest of the holy saints don't get to see the Father God. Forget about the Holy Spirit. The angels have been there eons of time. It says that God dwells in unapproachable light. What does this English word unapproachable means? Unapproachable. <laughs> Isn't it? So simple. Which means you cannot come close. If you cannot come close, how can you say, ah, this morning I was on the laps of the Father God. Figmentary imagination of the mind. But, it is absolutely possible when you live that Christ life to live in that realm. It is possible. Nothing is impossible, you know. All that is Christ are now ours. Right? by the blood of the Lamb of God, they are positionally ours. But, we now have to crystallize, crystallize that which we inherited by position and make it ours, your own. It's one thing to have a title deed and it is another thing to possess it. Right? The positionally in Christ is like having a title deed. But you need to inherit it now. Live there. It is absolutely possible. Throne room living is not just simply having a visit to heaven like a tourist. It is not like that, you know. Turn your Bibles with me now to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 10, there you will find something very interesting. In Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 22, he says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say his flesh, See, when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, 
the temple veil was torn in two. And when his sight was pierced, the body of Christ. Now this is another mystery now that we are trying to understand. The temple veil was separating the most holy presence of God from the public. And the Lord Jesus, through this scripture now we read, his body is that veil. Which means, if you tear apart that body, you see inside there all the glories of God. Doesn't that what it means? Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 says, He is the express image of the invisible God. What does that mean? Express image. Invisible God you cannot see. And God is light. Unapproachable light. Cannot be seen. But that light is covered now with a flesh. So, if you tear that flesh, what do you see? That unapproachable light. Heaven is not far away, no? It is in Christ Jesus. This mystery is very simple, but it is difficult to understand. But it is very simple, you know? Death is not death. It's not dying, no? You're stepping into Christ. When you step into Christ, you're stepping into heaven itself. Why did the Lord Jesus say, He who has seen me has seen the Father? Because his flesh is the external covering of the invisible God. You cannot see the Father God. No man can see him and leave. The scripture says, right? John chapter 1 verse 18. But when you see the Lord Jesus Christ, the image of the Lord Jesus Christ is the filtered down of all the glory of God. In a very, very, very simple percentage. But when you linger, and you linger, and you linger, you will begin to see the glory of the Father. That is why he said, he who has seen me has seen God. By seeing his physical, you are beholding the invisible. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, when you live the crucified life, the supernatural life in the spiritual realm, it is seated together with Christ Jesus in the heavenly realm and living there and ruling from there. If you read Revelation chapter 5 verse 10, it says there that God has now made us a kingdom of priests to reign the earth. When you are seated together with Christ Jesus in heaven, you are going to see everything not from an earthly perspective, but from a heavenly perspective. From a heavenly perspective, everything is already accomplished, finished, done. On this earth, we can't see all that yet. So we are struggling. We face challenges. We get discouraged. We go up, we go down. We go up, we go down. Christian life is a roller coaster. Have you been there? It's a roller coaster. But if you are seated on the throne, if you had seen your end, and you know that your messed up life as it is right now is not going to remain messed up forever, but you're going to be glorious, beautiful, and a reigning champion. If you can see that, will you live a messed up, miserable life now? No. You won't. Because you know what is your end. Yeah. And when you know your end, you will live like a king. Isn't it? 
in order to know your end, you must live in Christ. You must be seated there. Once you are seated there, then you are reigning with Christ Jesus. This is the real throne room living. When you live and you know that all the enemies of God are put under his feet. Why do you think the Lord Jesus Christ is so calm in the midst of all the difficulties that we face, with all the mess that is going on around us? Why is he so calm? As if he can do anything. Have you been there? Because, simply because, he knows what's the end. He knows it's not going to be like that. Let me give you one small little example that comes to my mind right now. In the year 1998, the Lord called me to go and blanket the nation of Tibet with prayer. So he gave me a plan to go seven or ten trips to, to make into Tibet, crisscrossing the nation, all over the entire nation, just to blanket with prayer. Nothing else, no evangelization, no giving out tracts, just praying. So on one particular trip, we had to go on a land cruiser, climb up a high mountain at 17,000 feet above sea level. And it was winter. The whole nation was covered with snow. So gorgeously beautiful, you know. So we hired a land cruiser from the city of, the capital city called Lhasa. It's a 13-day journey. So before we began our journey, I told the driver, you know, this is winter now, and your tires all look bald. Do you have safety gear? He said, don't worry, sir. And he showed me the chains that he put around the tire to have traction on the snow. We started driving, you know, and then we hit real icy snow, and we skidded several times. So I told him, why don't you just stop the vehicle and put those chains? He said, don't worry, sir. Everything is under control. Okay. And not only we pray for the nation, we also pray for our own lives. <laughs> and several, several times, we almost encountered bad accidents because of those bald tires and those slippery roads, you know. And in all the dangers that we face, he never would put those chains around the tire. Why he wouldn't do it, I don't know. It's not going to cost him any extra money, you know, right? Anyway, now we are climbing up this high mountain and the whole mountain is covered with thick snow. So before we started the journey, I told him, look, you better listen to me. <laughs> I'm paying you. I am ordering you right now to put the chains on the wheels. He looked at me and he said, don't worry, sir. I said, the issue is not whether I'm worried or not worried. The issue is you better obey what I say. Again, he looked at me, don't worry, sir. If it is necessary, I will do it. Okay, what, what else you're going to say, you know? Sir? The Tibetans look very calm, you know, but if they enter into a temper, you don't want to be near them. Anyway, so we started climbing up the mountain, and the mountain was very steep. Steep, you know. We're climbing up the mountain by the grace of God. <laughs> we made it to the top without any problem. Now, we are going to come down. <laughs> So I told this guy, now you better listen to me. <laughs> going down is going to be more dangerous than going up. So you better put those chains now. I even helped him. I went into his the luggage area. I took out those chains and said, now put it. 
If you won't do it, I will do it. He looked at me and said, Don't worry, sir. Don't worry. I know my roads. I know my nation. I can take care. I said, okay. Now we had 17,000 feet above sea level. At that height, you can see the whole world. So beautiful, you know. All the high mountains, all beautifully decorated like Christmas trees. So, of course, my pleasure of enjoying the scenery had mixed feelings. <laughs> now the fears were occupying my heart. What's going to happen when I'm going to go down, you know? Anyway, we started the journey. And way and behold, just I had warned him for 10 days, my prophecy came to pass. It's a long slope down, and as he was about to make a bend, another truck came from the opposite direction, and they don't honk, you know. And because they were about to crash, he surfed, he turned the wheel around, and it began to skid on those ice, and it skidded. Now remember, we are up at 17,000 feet. And the entire truck shifted right to the edge of the mountain. And two of the tires were hanging on the edge. Just like that, you know. And instantly, the driver shouted, he had the nerve. We were hang dangling like that. He shouted, Don't move! <laughs> so I looked at him and said, Now you say that. <laughs> Two of the tires, you know, were dangling. One bad move, even one inch of a move, can send the entire land cruiser down 17,000 feet. And four lives will be gone. So I was praying. <laughs> I dared not even breathe. You know? So praying, Lord, please forgive this foolish driver <laughs> who was so stubborn and obstinate. Please forgive him, Lord. Be merciful. I know you will protect me. I know you will protect my associate. Because of me, please also protect them. So then he said, now please move inch by inch. So we move inch by inch. And I was the first person to come out of that Land Cruiser. <laughs> now, here comes the best part of the story. As soon as I came out of the cruiser, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing right beside the road. I looked at him and said, You have been standing here all this while? <laughs> so why didn't you prevent that? He just smiled and he seemed to confirm what the driver has been saving all this while. He said, Why are you worried? I have been upholding you, haven't I? I'm standing here, right here beside you. What is that for you to worry? It didn't drop down. I'm holding it with my hands. You know, in all my travels, in all my supernatural encounters like this, it has solidified my faith to believe that God does miracles not to prevent it you know but in the midst of a danger he supernaturally sustains the land cruiser did not it could have but he was holding it until we all came out safely out except the driver i told him you stand you sit there <laughs> you sit there 
and we will push the truck safely with you inside it. <laughs> See, the presence of the Lord is there, you know, in the midst of the danger. Is there, guiding us, sustaining us. My dear brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus told me, I'm there to protect. See, he saw the end from the beginning. And he knows that the truck is not going to fall over because he's going to protect. But because I could not see that, I was fretting. If I had seen it before, I would be singing in the sweet by and by. <laughs> Even if it's going to tip over, I know for sure it will never fall because I have seen it before. When you sit in the heavenly places, you can see the end from the beginning. That is throne room living. That is real kingdom theology. Not all the other kinds of teachings you have heard before. The real kingdom living is to be seated with the Lord Jesus Christ. Living there, seeing the books of life, seeing the scrolls of your destiny, seeing the book of your own life, knowing that which is written of you, and then accomplishing it as it is written in heaven. So shall it be on this earth. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. What is God's will for you in heaven? You, have, you can only know that when you live there. When you live there, you have access to see your book. You can read your book and you'll know this is that which I am to do. See, the Lord Jesus said, Lo, I come to do your will. It is written of me in your book. Everything, every action the Lord Jesus did, even when he was hanging on the cross, every word that he spoke is like he was reading of a script. If you read Psalms 22, whatever is written there was what he spoke on the cross. See, he knew what is written of him and he knew what to speak on the cross. This is what I should say. Nothing more, nothing less. In Isaiah 53, it is written, Like a lamb that is brought into a slaughter, that is quiet. So he knew that, so he acted it out, so I must not open my mouth and grumble. He was quiet, never opened his mouth. When he stood before Pilate, Herod, and the Sanhedrin council, he never opened his mouth because... He was acting out the prophecy that is written in Isaiah 53. Because he saw, he knew he lived there. He knew he's not going to be in the grave forever. Just three days, that's all. He knew that. So he spoke, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. He spoke confidently because he knew he knew the end from the beginning so could you you can know your end from the beginning if you live there to such a life God is calling you come live there so that you can know the end from the beginning living there and on this earth at the same time how is it possible in 1983, I was at a prayer meeting and the glory of God fell. There was a college professor in the group and uh, the power of God fell upon him. He fell into a trance, he was taken up to heaven. And whatever he was seeing in heaven he was, or speaking with the Lord Jesus, his mouth was, we could hear him speaking. So the leader of the ministry had me and another prophet friend of mine who is, going to, who, is, who is one of the speaker at the Jerusalem conference. We sat around him and the rest of the people were all dismissed and we heard him having a conversation with the Lord Jesus. After about one hour, 
Now, please listen very carefully. I want you to remember some details. I and my friend were 100% awake because we were listening to what he was talking. We were not asleep. We were not praying. We were not waiting on God. We were 100% awake. You follow? Okay. Now, this professor, when he came out of the vision, he was like a drunk man, dazed for a few more minutes. And then he looked at me. Then he looked at my friend. And he repeatedly stared at us for five to ten minutes. And we were wondering why he's staring at us. And he said, I saw you both in heaven. Now, that is an impossibility. We were not praying. We were not waiting on God. We were wide awake. How is that possible? If we were wide awake. And he claimed that he saw us in heaven. How can we be in heaven and on earth at the same time? This was in 1983. I never ever understood until one day I read John chapter 3 verse 13. If you read John chapter 3 verse 13, it says, The Son of Man is in heaven and on this earth two places at the same time. Seems that it is possible. When you live that crucified life, that resurrected life, in Christ Jesus, you are living in two worlds at the same time. And when you walk in that realm, the you in heaven sees the books of life in heaven and then communicates to you, imparts to you, that which is of you, the will of God in heaven. And you will know this is that which is written, have the mind of Christ. Have the mind of Christ. This is that which he said. When you live there, you are there in the kingdom of God. You are there sitting and reigning in the kingdom of God, knowing the mind of God. You have the mind of Christ in you because you are there, seated. When you are there, what you know there is what you know here. You have the mind of Christ. To such a glorious, supernatural, exciting life, God is calling you. After today, put a full stop to this dog's life or cat's life. Put a full stop. You should no more go back to the good for nothing, meaningless life that you are living. Do you still want to go back? No. You should not go back to that useless life, boring life. You know, when you live there, you are living in, there is two family in heaven. If you read Ephesians chapter 3 verse 15, the whole family of God, the family in heaven and the family on earth, there is two family. Dual family. What is the dual family? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24. There it says, And you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, and the church of the firstborn. See, they all are different. They're not the same. The general assembly is different. The church of the firstborn is different. And before God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, different, different places. The different places of abode is all written very beautifully here in this scripture. The different realms of existence. The realm where Mount Zion is. 
the realm where the general assembly is, the realm where the church of the firstborn is, the realm where the different grades of saints in heaven are, the realm where the martyrs are, the realm where God the Father abodes, and the realm where the Lord Jesus is. In my Father's house are many mansions, many realms of existence. See, so beautifully, very clearly written here. You are called, this is your family up there. This is your family. The family in heaven and there's a family on earth. When you live that resurrected life, when you live that life, you are hearing, you are seeing, you are hearing there, seeing what is there and producing the works on this earth. Let me give you one very good, simple example. If you read 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 9 to 12, you see the prophet Elijah seated on a hill. Now, to give you a little background about this mighty man of God, 1 Kings chapter 17 up to chapter 19, you read about his great exploits. Then, a woman, the Queen Jezebel, threatens to kill him and he runs for his dear life. He runs to his dear life. He comes to Mount Horeb after a 40-day fast. There, he has an encounter with the living God of Israel. He sees the glory of God. And he hears the audible voice of God talking to him. And then God gives him a new commission. Okay, you will not die. You will not die. And I have a future work for you to do. He had an encounter and he was transformed, translated, even before he was taken up to heaven. Let me show you proof of that. If he was not transformed and translated physically, he could not have stepped into the throne of fire or the chariot of fire that came. He could not have stepped there. He was literally translated and transformed before he went to heaven. When his foot stepped on the chariot that came from heaven, he was already translated. That the time that he from the time that he had an encounter with God and the time that he was taken up to heaven, that interval period of time, that one encounter changed transform him. You know, the new book that I wrote, the Maharishi of Kailash, is one such person living on this earth who was transformed and translated. He's about 400 years old, given eternal life by the Lord Jesus Christ, and still alive on this earth. Physically living at the same time. And they will not die. They cannot die. Because they already have eternal life. And the reason why God asked me to write the book is to bring a awareness to the body of Christ that there are many, many such people hidden. Hidden by God. And after the rapture, they will come out. To minister to those who are left behind. They will come out of their hiding. Translated, transformed, preserved. Now let's come back to Elijah. If you look at this man who was so frightened of a woman and he ran away. Now you look at him in Second Kings. Seated on a hill. Please take note of that. He was seated on a hill and soldiers come to arrest him. And he was seated there so confident, fearless. And he said, now mark these words, If I am he who stands in the presence of God, then let fire come down and consume you. Two things, you know, he was seated on a hill and he says, I am standing 
in the very presence of God. Those words that he spoke, spoke from a translated life. Now reigning and seated in heaven, dual life, dual kingdom. He is on earth and in heaven at the same time. So much of confidence, fearless. Three occasion, soldiers came to arrest him. He never moved an inch. Just seated very calmly, fearless, boldly, he said. If I am a prophet of the Most High God and standing in the presence of God, let fire now consume you. He just spoke those words. That's all. Signs and wonders took place. He was literally translated and transformed before he stepped onto the chariot. So, this is what happened to Enoch. The translation and the transformation took place while he was still on this earth and then he transformed into life and was no more here. Transformed into light. And the legendary saint in India called Sadhu Sundar Singh, he never died. On his last visit to Tibet, he was standing up on a mountain and looking into the valley, two angels of God met him and they said, your work is finished. The father is calling you home now. And they tapped on his shoulder. I saw this in a vision, you know. They tapped on his shoulder and his old mortal body fell off from him like you will take a cloth and drop it down. Just like that. It was so amazing, you know. The old body, the mortal body fell down to the ground like a cloth falling down and he stood there transformed translated transformed translated when you live a life the resurrected life the light within you will begin to shine out the intensity will begin to grow little by little by little now if you read Acts chapter 3 verse 4 when Peter stood at the temple gate and he, the beggar, he told him, look at me, look at me. Now why would Peter say like that, look at me? What has he that the man, the lame man, was begging for a few pennies, look? What was he saying, look at me? When he said, look at me, he was Telling him, the kingdom of God is within me now. Look at that kingdom. Look at that kingdom. In that kingdom, you are transformed. You are no more lame. You are whole. Look into me. Look. In Luke 17, 21, the scripture says, the kingdom of God is within you. It's within you. This is a mystery. Second Corinthians 6 16. It says, when you live a life of incorruption in your physical body, when your body is dedicated to God, that you don't allow corruption to come into your body. Like Daniel chapter 1. Daniel says, I purpose in my heart that I will not defile my body. You must pay attention to those words. Why would Daniel speak like that? I will not defile my body. Your body is the temple of the living God. So this is the temple. Within it resides the glory of God. You don't want to defile that glory. You don't want to bring things into your body. That is why, you know, all the flesh, don't think because the flesh will corrupt, you don't have to worry what you do to the flesh. Be careful. What you do, you're touching the temple of God. Don't bring corruption. 
don't defile your body and second corinthians 6 16 says don't have an adulterous relationship with the world because what is in the world it will corrupt you contaminate you and when it contaminates you what you see what you hear what you speak it contaminates you when it is contaminated then the holy presence of god departs just like how he departed many times from the temple of god in jerusalem he departed ezekiel saw the glory of god departing from the temple and you read in the scriptures concerning samson the holy spirit left him concerning saul the holy spirit left him it is possible the glory of god can depart from you when you defile the temple of the living god and when you don't defile you live a life of sanctification you dedicate your body no defilement on your flesh you protect your virginity your chastity keep yourself wholly clean until the day of your marriage no defilement comes then second corinthians 6:16 says god will walk in you and live in you that's what the scripture says a sanctified life no defilement and when you close your eyes you look at the kingdom of god within you it's right there right there within you don't have to take a flight all the way up there it's there here and you enter in there just like that he walks in you he talks with you to commune with you there that is the resurrected life in the spirit that is the resurrected life my dear brothers and sisters the resurrected life this is what the apostle paul says the life which i now live what life he lives now the resurrected christ life that he lives is supernatural now the kingdom of god is light if you read first timothy chapter 6 was 15 and 16 he says that god dwells in unapproachable light he dwells in unapproachable light i live in a house how do you understand this i live in this country in the place when the scripture says god lives in in unapproachable light the entire region where god dwells is unapproachable light and if you read revelation chapter 22 verse 5 21 verse 23 it talks that god's light lights up heaven and james chapter 1 verse 17 says he is the father of lights my dearly beloved brothers and sisters what am i bringing across to you now is this the kingdom of god that is within you it is a kingdom of light that light can be allowed to manifest in the flesh when you allow that light to manifest in that flesh it will renew it will transform it will translate and change if you read about moses in exodus chapter 34 it tells us in verses 29 to 35 that his face began to shine when he was talking with god how is that possible how can this flesh this skin shine i'll tell you how it's possible see science tells us these eyes are the entrance of light he came and stood before the pillar of fire and he saw the fire and the light was entering into his eyes entered into his being and the scripture says you are light it touched the light that was within him and been soaked and soaked 
and soaked in the light of God. It began to flood his being. And when the body was so flooded with light, it began to seep out through the sweat pores on your skin. And the skin literally begins to shine out with light. Every one of you can come to that place where you are transformed as light. You know, when you allow the light of God, and by the way, the light of God is different from the light that you see coming from the stars or from the sun. The light of God is pure, so much pure. Several years ago, standing in the same stage, while I was preaching, I saw that light of God, about two feet in length, brilliant white light in an open vision. That light, when you allow, you know, all the plasma in your blood, they can carry that light. When the plasma carries the light of God, the cells and the blood in your body is transformed as light. And your body will not be flowing with blood, it will be flowing with light. And when it flows with light, that is the translated life. It is possible, you know. You come, you live there. See, if you read Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, it says the Lord Jesus was praying, praying and praying and praying, and soon his face began to shine. It was a gradual thing that took place, not instantaneous, you know. Gradually, the light increased and increased and increased until he was shining so brightly like the noonday sun. Not just the face, the entire body was shining. He was enveloped with a ball of light. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, this is the resurrected life. Every one of you, it doesn't matter you are a high Christian or low Christian, matured believer or immature believer, it doesn't matter. If you are willing and sincerely desirous to pursue and to seek, waiting on God, seeking the face of God, abiding in His holy presence, you can be transformed. The light entering. If you read 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Walk in the light. What light? The fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. When you do the fellowship, you are walking in the light. God is light. When you dwell in the light, your entire being, is flooded with light. When you do that, I saw in a vision, you know, the light of God entering into your skin, it changes the cells and prevents decay, prevents death. It changes. The corruption puts on incorruption. You are made to live, not to die. Right? We are created to live, not to die. In Christ Jesus, by the blood of the Lamb, it is now possible to overcome death, even while you are still living in this world. You live in this world and in the world to come. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, to such a richness, God is inviting every one of you. Come. And sit by the master's table and eat the food that I am eating. Don't eat frozen TV dinners anymore. <laughs> Let's stand up for a word of prayer.